des questions. Et je dois dire que le moment est, est venu pour euh, le développement euh, de le commerce équitable pour euh, améliorer la participation et la transparence euh, dans la distribution des bénéfices. Et à la fin de la journée, ça va marcher si euh, la participation au marché, dans les marchés mondial pour les produits euh, de commerce équitable s'améliore. Si euh, euh, le premium euh, sur les prix est réparti d'une manière équitable, et dans la République dominicaine, la production de bananes, la production de cacao et, et expérimente une croissance incroyable et la participation dans le marché mondial est, est beaucoup plus grande et tous les jours, tous les ans. Et comme résultat, et le niveau de vie des producteurs s'améliore tous les ans. Donc c'est une réalité et j'espère que ça sera aussi la réalité éventuellement dans le marché du sucre. Parce que sinon, et, il, il faudra fermer toutes les productions dans les Caraïbes. Et voilà, et ce n'est pas un futur euh, et très, très et équitable, je dirais. Alors, euh, les francophones, j'espère que vous avez beaucoup de questions parce que les traducteurs vont partir euh, et 12h45. Voilà, vous avez la parole. Midi 30, donc on a 5 minutes. Alors, euh, la dame, s'il vous plaît. I'm, I'm sorry, it's in English, but I also have to leave at 12.30. <laughs> um, um, I'm, my name is Christine Gent. Um, I'm from IFAT. That's I-F-A-T, the International Fair Trade Association. And, and just to say on the issue of raising awareness and connecting producers and consumers globally around the world, we have World Fair Trade Day, which is on the 10th of May every year. And this year we will have people from all over North America, Austria, Germany, Africa, Latin America, Asia, celebrating World Fair Trade Day. So I would, and even increasingly in Europe, um, people are changing their, their week, which historically has been in different weeks around the year, to May, to, for everybody to celebrate World Fair Trade Day. So I'd like to invite those of you from other countries to please support our fair trade organizations, many of whom we've heard about today, such as twin trading, interfest trading, um, and you can find those on the website, which is ifat.org, um, and please support them in their activities. So, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Alors, uh, messieurs, au fond, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je n'ai aucun doute sur les, les intentions et les contributions du mouvement du commerce équitable. Mais je suis un peu préoccupé par la double discrimination de certains groupes de producteurs, petits producteurs dans les pays ACP. D'un côté, ils sont discriminés par les conditions générales du marché, et d'un autre côté, ils sont discriminés par le mouvement du commerce équitable, parce que, pour des raisons diverses, ils n'ont pas l'étiquette. J'aimerais avoir la réaction de, du panel sur ce problème. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Au fond, je crois qu'il y a une deuxième question. Et ici, au fond. S'il vous plaît, monsieur, si vous pouvez vous introduire. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll introduce myself again. My name is Lutangu from Comesa. Um, the question uh, which I'm posing is to the first speaker. You mentioned that uh, they have been doing a bit of assistance in terms of the coffee industry in Uganda. I wanted to know which institution they they were working with because Comesa has done quite a number of activities in that area by working with the Eastern African Fine Coffee Association, YAFCA. And uh, the program which is supporting uh, uh, um, YAFCA within Comesa is uh, rates and it's coming. So that probably they can also come in terms of assistance. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one last question here for the time being so that we can give uh, the floor to the panelists. Please. My name is Damian Sala. I'm the coordinator of Africa Fair Trade Network. Or what I want to ask is not a, it's not a specific question, but it's an observation, which I, I think I would want to ask the people, the organizers of this meeting and whoever is here to try to think about it. We hear that fair trade has been there for over half a century, and the producers are still hoping. 
Now, the, what we can see here, there is a seriousness on the part of the consumers to send something to the, to the producer. Now, we are trying, and the different organizations are trying their very best to make sure that the producers get this money from the consumers go to the producers. My worry is we are having too many hands in the chain and producers complaining everybody, every day. Now, even if the fair trade movement delivers the cake which is really planned, it may be quite difficult for the producers to get, to get the, 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 their share. So I would ask there should be more seriousness on the part of the fair trade activists to make sure, including the, the EU government, to, to see that there is a mechanism to ensure that more goes to the producers in terms of minimum prices and premium rather than really financing different, 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 many, many, many organizations because after all, fair trade, fair trade is business. And in business, it's not the philanthropy, that's what we hear, it's fair trade. So there should be some seriousness to see that something is done seriously to help the producers. Otherwise, it will be hope, hope, hope for producers. And without this seriousness, I'm sure even our efforts for, for this global warming will never make it because with poverty, poverty, you cannot have that succeeding. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. So I'll give the floor to the speakers uh, in the same order they took the floor in the panel. So starting with Samuel, please. Okay. Uh, we support uh, Gumut Gumutindo organization just because uh, they are in the flow registered. So they are certified as a fair trade producer organization. That's the reason why we support that organization. I don't know if your organization or um, is a member of IFAT or flow. Uh, well, uh, Chair, through you, I think Bobby okay. was directing that question uh, to me. Um, uh, the reason why I mentioned East African uh, Fine Coffee Association, it's, uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite a bit strong in the Eastern uh, African region, and uh, Comesa has been supporting their effort in terms of probably trying to stand on its own as an association. So when I saw the coffee uh, figures that you were giving us in terms of assistance, I thought probably maybe as we are assisting them, it would also be fine and probably maybe probably in terms of regional and uh, uh, probably trade within the, uh, the global industry that probably maybe you could also come in. I thought probably you are affiliated also in terms of assistance to that organization. Thank you. Well, I hope one side benefit of this uh, outstanding get-together we've had this morning is that you finally affiliate and that uh, you get together and resolve this issue because uh, uh, contacts are, are made in these international meetings and uh, they should serve that kind of purpose. So, uh, Christopher, uh, you will have some uh, responses to the questions posed, please. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, <coughs> the question of access to label is quite important, all the work that, that, that we're doing. The the, the way we are trying to approach it is by having the groups work together, you can have more efficiency, which will lower their cost and then allow them to expand their programs with the hope that that will then provide more benefits to the smallholders, more access access to those programs. However, that is an internal question of the program itself, and it is a limitation that as the demands increase, where more producers want to enter the program, but they're not but they're not able to, and there isn't the capacity at the individual program level to provide that certification. So, it, so it is a real issue that that, that has to be addressed. Um, we we work closely with 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 the Africa, the East African Fine Coffee Association, and they're on our steering committee, and we we we, we had completed research. Uh, it's, it's called gap analysis, looking at the trans transaction cost, the transitional cost between current practices and sustainable complying practices. And one of the places we did that in was in was in Mosaka in in in, uh, in Uganda, as well as El Salvador and Brazil. So I can send you the results of that report as well, which might help in this dealing with Africa's movement and afterwards. Um, uh, and 
sort of in reference to the question about whether or not the benefits are actually reaching the farmer and, and the business aspect of it, the cost-benefit analysis, that is our approach, that we need, this is a business, and we need to have information on whether or not the actual cost and benefits at the farm level are reaching there. And so uh, by having measurement at the farm level, regardless of what the program says, to actually look at the farm level, what are the costs and what are the benefits that are being received at the farm level is a way we're trying to address that, that issue you raised. Very good. Uh, you have uh, some replies uh, to the question? Oui, en fait, euh, moi, je voudrais peut-être rebondir sur la préoccupation de la double discrimination. Effectivement, euh, avec le coût actuel de la certification, euh, il y a un problème pour tous les... Il n'y a pas de traduction. <rire> voilà, voilà, ça fait encore deux fois. <rire> Ben oui, c'est ça. Pauvre producteur. Bon, si je vais continuer en français. Ok, we are we are going to try to make it a bit. Uh, that, that's why it was first for the French uh, speakers. It was out of courtesy. But please go ahead. I will try to help you. Donc euh, nous, en, 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 en tant que organisation de producteurs. Ce que nous avons proposé à Flo, mais dans lequel le débat n'est pas encore très bien avancé parce que les, les responsables de Flo à qui nous nous sommes adressés ont dit qu'ils allaient remonter, bon on était, on était chez nous, donc ils allaient remonter au nord et puis nous donner une suite. Mais on ne désespère pas encore d'avoir cette suite. En fait, pour la prise en charge de, de l'ensemble des producteurs qui, qui peuvent être dans des organisations, le schéma qu'on a proposé à Flo, c'est il faut certifier les organisations à la base. Mais il faut aussi avoir un mécanisme qui permette de certifier des organisations de niveau 2 ou de niveau 3. Niveau 2, ok, euh, ils sont favorables à ça. Mais le niveau 3, qui a la capacité d'avoir plus de partenaires financiers qui permettent de développer des programmes de formation pour donner une qualification aux producteurs dans la gestion de leurs organisations, pour permettre de prendre en charge les engagements pris par ce niveau 3 par rapport au cahier des charges, et on a encore du mal à faire en sorte que on, on regarde dans le même sens. Pour nous, ça, ça réduirait énormément le, le, le coût d'encadrement ou le coût de certification, parce que le système de contrôle interne qui est la base de, de cette validation-là serait plus facilité et pourrait être pris en charge par l'organisation de niveau 3 elle-même sur le terrain. Ce qui fait que la confiance permettrait de réduire énormément le coût Donc, je ne dirais pas d'involver, mais d'intégrer une plus large gamme de producteurs dans, 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 la, dans la certification, parce que c'est cette organisation qui sera porteuse du certificat de, label, de labellisation devant les producteurs. Voilà. That is work, yes. Mr. Watara uh, is saying that the organi uh, producers' organizations have proposed to flow to the organization of flow, uh, um, and there is do some dialogue there. They are waiting a bit for feedback, and actually their, their problem is uh, um, to uh, uh, support the organizations, specifically on the certification, and uh, uh, um, certification at the level two is fine because it's all favorable, but at, uh, at the level three is still a challenge. Um, especially on the capacities uh, to have more uh, financial means, to have training, and the fa he, he makes a point in saying that to have a trust and to have some dialogue there would uh, reduce their costs by um, getting in, in board more um, uh, producers. Okay, Solina, well, we uh, didn't know you had such a wonderful additional skill. Uh, <laughs> congratulations. Uh, I'm told the uh, translators uh, don't make that bad of a salary, so uh, <laughs> your boss uh, must be careful, huh? <laughs> okay, so any other questions? Please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. My name is Ivere Tarabena from Embassy of Uganda, and I have one question or two for uh, Mr. Uh, Chris. Uh, and uh, others who have talked about uh, market access and the market uh, sustainability. 
But uh, I must say that uh, at the moment we, we are still struggling with the SPS, which we were introduced a few years ago. Those were standard certificate to meet, and they have also mentioned these uh, standards, the, the, the fair trade standards are also difficult and costly and so on. Uh, we have uh, the food miles are also coming on board, and uh, uh, I mean, how, how do we reconcile the two to, to sustain the market when the market conditions are not predictable? I think there is a problem here, so uh, maybe I would wish to hear from uh, Mr. Chris's comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. I saw a hand in the back. Uh, please, you have the floor, sir. Um, whilst uh, applauding Tate and Lyle's decision to, to move over to fair trade sugar to the very echo, um, I think f for the fair trade movement as a whole, uh, this kind of development uh, does require some serious issues to be explored. And I think Barry's raised some of them already. Uh, but I think we need to keep it, everything in context. We need to p keep it in the context of the changes on the EU market and the intensification of competition that's going to take place within Europe as national markets become European markets instead of fragmented national markets. And we need to keep in context that if you translate 60 US dollars per ton into the additional costs, it works out about 1.5 pence per bag uh, on, on the supermarket shelves uh, in terms of the fair paid premium. And I think the last time I went to Sainsbury's, a 500 gram bag was costing something like a fair trade sugar. And for granulated sugar, about 67 pence, I think. 60, 70 pence, is it? Oh, it's a kilo, is it? Okay, so that's three, that's three pence a bag. So I, I think we need, we need to just keep that in context um, w w in the debate about the fair trade premium, to s see it in the evolving market context. Because one cannot divorce these changes from the evolving changes which are taking place in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the lady in my left hand side, please. You have the floor. Yeah, Karen Ulmer from Upper Def. Um, I'd like to ask a question with regard to the title of the second panel and perhaps a suggestion for a further um, session. Could we also look at some stage into the question can fair trade better link ACP producers to southern ACP consumers? Or can fair trade better link EU producers to? Um, southern consumers. Picking up a bit on the question about food miles, the question about import and exporting, and the question to the panel, to which extent do fair trade movement also look into creation of local and regional markets and supplying consumers in those countries? And um, it's, um, it also links up to, to, I think, the categories of standards that has been presented by the retailer. I think in Germany, for example, you would have an organic label and a fair trade label. So the organic and the fair trade label in common have both times they would support also smallholders and local initiatives. Whereas the, the organic one would be more on the domestic market and the fair trade more on the international market. Could we have something like that in, in terms of the southern countries offering an, a local domestic market and an international market to increase also the possibilities um, of um, trading and of production? Thanks. Very good, very good question. Uh, two more questions before I give the floor back to the panel. Well, <laughs> four more questions, and people want to take the floor again. Time is running out. It's already uh, 12.40, so please be brief. Uh, Nigel, please. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Ambassador. The, the last presentation that we had uh, demonstrated the many dimensions of sustainability uh, that need to be addressed. I'm wondering about the extent to which the, the, the fair trade movement sees itself as a catalyst for bringing together um, at the, 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 the community and farm level some of the services uh, that are currently lacking. Uh, questions have been raised about finance, particularly microfinance and so on. Uh, but of course, there, there, there are other dimensions that, that, that have to be, be, um, be, be looked into. Um, to what extent do they see themselves as a catalyst, not necessarily in terms of, of, um, of financing these services, but of, of providing some means by which other organizations, other entities uh, can bring some of these services uh, to, to, to bear on the, 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 the production systems? 
Thank you very much. Uh, I'll take two more questions before I give the floor back to the panel. Please, uh, my left hand side. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Klaus Niederlander from the CDE. And I have just a quick question with regard to, I mean, we've heard a lot that uh, fair trade has really moved into uh, second or even third gear and uh, moving more into mainstream, working a lot also with transnational companies. And I'm wondering um, how the, the effect that's going to have, because this, uh, the system becomes more complex, especially also when you look into products like with cotton, where you have a large supply chain in the textile industry. And who, how do you share the burden of the management of the system, uh, especially with those large companies, in terms of risk management, you know, uh, when you know in such a supply chain, and also in terms of cost sharing, you know, how much can the actual fair trade movement flow and such, you know, take really on on their back, and how much should actually be shared by those uh, large companies, which are in a different ball game than, than the former small uh, shops uh, and uh, uh, small retailers. Thank you. Yeah, one last question in the back, and then we give the floor back to the panel. Please. I'll be very short. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just an extension of, of, of Nigel's. I see here um, in the last presentation, low average output. It clearly means that your input is at variance with your output. Um, what does the fair trade movement do, or what has been done to ensure that there is adequate reinvestment at the production level to ensure that sustainable production that is spoken about uh, so expressed in the fair trade movement? Okay, so. Uh Isolina, you want to play the role of a translator again? That way we start uh, with Mamadou first, uh, if he has uh, something else to say. Well, Mamadou, you have something to say for the questions that are posed? No, it's maybe posed in English, all the questions, so unfortunately. So we go back to Samo, please. Sam. <laughs> Samo, please. Yes, but uh, I'm not a member of the fair trade movement, so I, d I don't have to, to, to respond to, 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 to those questions. Uh, regarding the south of the um, local market, we support a pilot project in India uh, to um, support fair trade within that country. So that's a, a key issue for uh, the f future. Yeah. Thank you, Samuel. Chris? Thank you. Uh, I'll try to respond to the questions that I have answers for. The mandatory standards is quite I interesting for us, the, the, the relationship between mandatory standards and private standards, and how the SPS standards relate to these private certification standards. Um, our, our, our approach is that by developing strong businesses, strong enterprises that have quality management systems that function, is a key way to make sure that the producers are able to address mandatory standards. <coughs> As I mentioned before, it's meaningless to be able to enter into a program, a uh, certification program, if you're not able to export your products. And if you're not able to meet these mandatory standards, then um, it's relatively useless to enter into a certification program. We would also like to see the possibility of linking government investment into the compliance of mandatory requirements with perhaps the support of meeting private standards. There's a lot of conflict there, and, uh, and we hear again again the public sector saying they can't be held responsible to support compliance with private standards, and the private standards generally don't see it as their responsibility to meet mandatory standards. However, as we all know, in producing countries, the resources are limited and by leveraging the expertise in verification, in capacity building, to address what often is r relatively similar issues in having a well-managed farm to be able to control its, its, its impacts and its risks. Um, if you could leverage the public and private funding to support that, it would be very helpful. Um, the issue about standards in South-South trade and regional trade that's something else that's become increasingly important. We now see that supermarkets in many areas, Latin America, Asia, and Africa, are 
taking on or introducing these kind of standards almost ad hocly into regional trade. So South Africa is a key example. South Africa, many of the major supermarkets have reach in and presence throughout South and East, East Africa, and they've been adopting standards that are often built from fair trade standards or other, or other types of standards. And now to access those markets, producers also have to meet those standards at the, at, at the, at the regional level. Um, so it, this isn't just a, a north-south trade issue, it's become a regional issue. And there's a lot of interest, and rightfully so, to develop regional and south-south trade. So that needs, not, that needs to be looked at. Um, regarding the question of moving into the mainstream, it, it, uh, if I understood correctly, it was stated that, that it's probably becoming more complex. But I would argue that w what needs to happen is for the programs to become less complex. So that's where efficiencies need, need, need to be achieved and, and, to, and to have these programs actually function and really meeting their objectives. Um, and the cost sharing issue, we, we believe that's important to see how to internalize these costs throughout the supply chain. The, the belief is that by making these supply chains sustainable, by meeting practice, by, by meeting sustainable practices, when they make sense, it's good for the entire supply chain. And so that cost should be shared throughout the supply chain. But again, those costs and benefits need, need, need to be identified. And admittedly, it's quite nice to say that, that costs should be shared through the supply chain, but in a very competitive business atmosphere, that, that, that isn't always what happens. So it might be that regulation needs to help support that or something. But <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, I apologize uh, to uh, a very close neighbor for having ignored her. Uh, she was asking for the floor for a long time ago. And unfortunately, my uh, side and lateral vision is not really <laughs> very good. That's why I'm wearing these reading glasses already. I only look young, you know. So please, uh, you have the floor. I apologize. No problem. I just asked for the floor once and you took it immediately. I just wondered uh, if there's an opportunity to address some of the key concerns which were raised about the fair trade system itself, since there's nobody really from the fair trade movement on, the, on this panel now. And very briefly, I want to tackle uh, three points if I can. One is uh, the question of uh, does the fair trade movement bring it see itself in a position to bring actors together uh, as a catalyst. So we definitely do. We engage with many different stakeholders from the consumers to un other standard setters as well to, of course, the producers as a main stakeholder and to c policy makers. An example of that is our, like the flow, particularly engagement in the setting of the ICL code of good uh, practice and standard setting in social and environmental standard setting. Flow has invested a lot in that in trying to raise up the level and make sure that environmental and social standard setting really brings back be benefit to people and the environment, particularly in the South. Just one of the many examples. Um, the question of risk management in the supply chain and cost sharing, I very much agree with what Chris has said, both on the need and on the problems here. Um, fair trade is probably the only system where these costs are being shared by definition, because traders have to pay some of these costs which often is not the case in, in private standard setting, where only the producers have to really carry the costs uh, or main parts of the costs. So uh, there are the examples, but Fairtrade is certainly leading the way here. And uh, there is a, is the price setting is such a sensitive issue, which may many of you, all of you know probably, the question of what is a fair price, both to really pay for sustainable living and production costs, but also a price that does not knock out the products from the start, from the market, if the fair price is too high, which we would, of course, we would like to have the highest possible fair price or price, then maybe uh, there's no possibility to market these products at all because the mainstream, the retailers, the buyers will just not be able or willing to pay these prices because they're completely uncompetitive through with that. So it's a very difficult, sensitive issue which needs a lot of careful management from all ends and, and uh, a lot of work which is invested here because it's such a sensitive and important point. Um, and then just the point on the double discrimination, which was raised several times, or two times, I think. Um, it's, a, it's a big discussion, but uh, of course we agree that small holders particularly are discriminated systematically in the international trading system. I would disagree with the, with the uh, sentence that fair trade 
adds to this discrimination. So for the producers who are in the system, it's obvious that we try to overcome these problems anyway, but also for the ones who we have not managed to bring into the fair trade system. The first reason, it's not that we don't want them, it's that there's not enough demand for it. That is the main reason why they are not in the system. And um, there may be costs and, um, and challenges associated to meeting standards, etc. but I don't think we discriminate here because we try to address these problems and to help producers to overcome these challenges where there is a possibility to then market the products. If we don't have any possibility to market the products, then it's no need to, to bring people up to fulfilling standards which they, they cannot sell for products they cannot sell. So I don't really agree with the sentence that there is a, that we add to the discrimination and I don't have the time to go into all the spillover effects of fair trade um, in for other communities, but we have a lot of literature. I've got a book here if anybody wants to read more about that. So thank you for giving me the floor again. Well, I think we all 